I like the story that Dan read, very simple, straightforward, to the point. It's like uh, God puts a hand on Jesus' shoulder and has one of those dad talks. And not the goofy kind of dad talk. We've all been in the goofy dad talk where he says these silly things and tells us to watch out for this. No, the good dad talks where you connect and, and, and it's meaningful. And I don't even know if, if Jesus quite knew exactly what was going on in that situation. I don't know if Jesus completely knew his calling or, or if he was aware of everything that happened before he was born. We don't know if at the outset of Jesus' ministry he could have even imagined himself as the Son of God. But at, at that moment in that story... God tells him everything that a son would ever want to hear from a dad. You're my boy. I love you. And I'm proud of you. You bring me joy. And especially on this Father's Day, think of what those kind of words could mean. God's words. uh, Or what if you could say the other way to your dad? You're my dad. I love you. You've done a good job. Or any of us in a relationship, especially at these moments of tenderness, what if we could just get to the point and name our relationship and say, you're important to me. This is how I love you. I think you do life very well. You enrich me. And let's hold on to that idea of what God says to us and that we can model to others. Um, It's going to take work to get to that point. It's going to take work to say words like that. Uh, Often, I had the children pick out a stole. This is called a stole. Uh, Usually, I'll have a kid come in there and pick it out. They look at this one, which looks kind of ratty, and the other ones are heavier and bigger and colorful, so they usually pick those. Um, But this one here is made of, handmade, by just strips of a white sheet just ripped in half, and and there's paint splattered on it, and drawings and pictures and and words, uh, Highlands Camp down the road. Um, Katie has been bugging me about this stole for about two years, and I've been keeping it secret, what it means, waiting for today. Because uh, she works at Highlands Camp now, and she should know how this, this, this uh, stole came from Highlands and the lessons that it taught me. Here's where it came from. I was on a planning team, a group of adults, that got together to plan a conference for teenagers at Highlands. Uh, a, a half a dozen adults put in all this time to, to prepare for a week of kids to have a great experience with God, which takes a lot of work because you have two worship services a day, three hours of these little small groups where kids get to talk about things that are important to them. Uh, You have these big games with 50 or 100 kids running over a huge area trying to have fun and and not get broken bones, which is the payoff when you have fun, broken bones. Uh, And and we would talk about what what kind of messages should we have? What should the the kids take home in, in their heart? So the teenage campers at the end of the week, they had a blast. They had a blast. They learned plenty. Our preacher did an awesome job. Highlands Camp is beautiful. You can't help but kind of feel close to God in that place. But the planning team, the adults, there was, uh, there was tension. There was a lot of tension in there. Most of the tension was between me and one other pastor on there. And it was pretty dramatic. You, you just, you, have you ever met those people where... Every time you turn around, they're saying something stupid or they just do something wrong. Like, you can't even breathe right. You know? you're, just, you're just breathing wrong, and it drove me crazy. And patience is a virtue. Barbara told me patience is a virtue, but some people, I don't need that much patience. Like, I've learned my lesson. I don't need that. And to be fair, this guy on the planning team did a great job with the kids, but our values clash all the time. I mean, The most important things in his life I'll let him rank them, but it's God, beef, and guns. <laughs> His idea of God was very different than mine, so we just couldn't line up on a lot of things. So we would be planning the conference, and, and I would say something like, well, what sort of activities do you want to do with the young people to engage them in worship? We don't want just people talking to them. We want to engage them. And he would say, oh, let's have a Big Mac eating contest. <laughs> i got 13 or 14 reasons why that's a bad idea, but patience, calm. What sort of game would you like to get the kids you know, involved all around the camp, all these hundred kids at once? What kind of game? And he, would, he said something like, well, how about Cowboys versus Indians, Silly String War? It's like, Cowboys versus Indians? Like, what century do you live in? Uh, but I tried. Peace, peace, peace. Uh, what kind of lesson do you want the kids to learn on Wednesday? We plan, plan it all out. What kind of lesson on Wednesday? And he would say, well, these teenagers, they need to repent of, other, of their sins so God can love them. No. Like, oh, I'm over here trying to do sustainability and inclusivity and grace. And he's over there taking apart the cross. So the top part is just a flagpole for America. And the cross piece is something you can whack people with. (laughs) So I'm just this little ball of righteous indignation and bitter moral superiority. And some of you, 
would be right, like, she, she'd be right with me on this one, yeah? Some of you are nicer than me, and you would have pity on this guy, because others of you would just laugh because he's a buffoon. Either way, if you feel kind of like I did at this point in the story, just wait till the end of it. You'll, you'll get your comeuppance. Others of you might be wondering, what was so wrong, Hanson? Sounds like it was your fault. <laughs> so, yeah, that second row is my fault. Because yeah. I was being haughty, and you know, there's nothing, nothing you, know, you shouldn't critique farming in Second Amendment, and we, shouldn't we teach our kids to be more ethical? Yes, we should. But if you folks are on that side, you really need to wait to hear the end of the story so we can wrap this together. Because through these weeks, through all week, every day we started making these stoles. And teens were learning about what a stole is, how it holds the burdens, it holds the weight of a community. That's what these things mean. Is it, it's it's kind of like a yoke. And I put it on as a symbol of holding that weight. And those teenagers put it on as a symbol of carrying people's weight, their difficulties. So we have these pictures of groups about community, symbols of justice, how that can work toward carrying weight. And after 18 months of planning the conference, five days of 18 hours a day chasing after kids, finally we get to the last worship where everyone has on their completed stoles with splint, paint splatters and everything. And right at the end of the worship, the preacher... Uh, he goes to do the benediction, and he instructs us to take our stoles off and to put it on someone who will carry our weight. And then to take someone's stole that you're willing to pray for when you go down the mountain. If you put on someone's stole, you're promising to pray for them. I wish that I had the spiritual revelation to just go over to that pastor and try to make things up. I wish we, we could do that and just clear the air and we could go shoot things and have fun together. <laughs> But as the preacher went into the benediction about carrying people's burdens, I didn't think once about my nuisance. I didn't like the guy. I didn't want to see him again. I would have been fine just holding a grudge and making him a parody for the rest of my life. But instead, he walked over to me. And he took off his stole, this one, and he put it on my shoulders. So I took my stole off. And I reached way up and put it on. He was a big guy. <laughs> I was shocked. I was, I was moved. I, I was humbled. I had a little regret about how the week had gone on and this missed opportunities to reconcile through that. And I don't know if he still has my stole. There's no way to know. Uh, but mine sits in my office. A little reminder for me that it, it is possible for all of us to take steps toward working through our differences. Hippies and rednecks, liberals and conservatives, we can take steps away from conflict and toward community. The the media says that rich and poor are fighting, this group fights that group, these neighbors are supposed to hate these neighbors, but we can all take steps toward reconciliation. And if we work at it, if we work at it, mutual forgiveness can change our hearts as much as anything in all the world. Now's the yabats. Yabat Hansen. It's not nearly that easy. I want to forgive so-and-so, but she doesn't want to talk to me. So, yeah, it's, it is hard sometimes. Forgiveness is hard. Uh, yeah, but Hanson, your little story is about a guy you worked with for one week. Forgiveness, great idea. But if you knew my family... <laughs> conflict is worse with family. It's the worst kind of conflict there is. And some people are just toxic and it doesn't... Sometimes you just, it's more than hard. Yeah, but Hanson, after your little story, you could get in a van and go back to Boulder and continue your life and call that guy if you wanted. What are we supposed to do when someone we love and that needs some reconciliation is at death's door or has died? Or as we come to death's door and we need a conversation, that's about as hard as forgiveness can get. And I don't want to bring this up as a guilt trip or, or to, to, to kind of put salt in any pain that people might have who have, who have loved ones have gone before and there might be leftover things hanging there. I'm, I'm sorry that happened. My hope is that this kind of a sermon and this kind of a message is going to help us to move forward with relief and some inspiration to reconcile in the future with those people that need that. Because sometimes when we face the death of someone that we really love, that almost just catapults us to work our stuff out right there. When we are faced with this is the end of our relationship, often it forces us to deal with those, those hidden issues that have been lingering for so long. Other times, it just brings more pain. And being at death's door, just more frustration and shame. Sometimes death is just a wall between people. And if you don't find a way to reconcile, that weight can linger on weak shoulders. And if you don't find a way to reconcile, it can be so hard to let go of that afterwards. 
Patty Griffin has a song that, at least the second verse, gets to this pretty, pretty, pretty closely. It's a song about a couple who's been married for 40 years until one of them dies. It is a sad song because death is sad, but I invite you to hear these words, especially the second verse, with some honor for their love and an encouragement for all of us to deal with things before they get to a point of regret. turning red I had some time to think about it and watch the sun sink like a stone I had some time to think about you on the long ride home headlights searching down the driveway the house is dark as it can be And it seems as empty as the inside of me I had some time to think about it And I watched the sun sink like a stone I had some time to think about you On the long, on the long ride home Said something like that, you think this is the worst Father's Day sermon you've ever heard. <laughs> Thing is, you know that we carry more, you know we carry more unresolved junk with our family than anywhere else. And, and, and couples are just oftentimes just forced to deal with it because they live together and they say all those things and they have to work it out. Moms and children, they have plenty of baggage, um, although eventually a lot of moms figure out that caring thing pretty well. But with, yeah, it's got happening right here. Look at this caring. Yeah. But with dads, some of our dads, and it's not universal, but far too often, I, I wish I knew why, dads don't say it, they don't show it, they didn't show up at the right times. Maybe they weren't there at all. Maybe it just would have been better if they weren't there at all. I don't know what it is about dads with affection and love and affirmation. It can be anyone, but so often fathers, as they wind down their children, will sit on a deathbed with a calcified grief. 
Watching bodies break down is hard enough. It's ugly. It's painful. But when you see people holding on because they're stuck with this other weight, maybe it's anger, Uh, maybe there's some conversation they just have been waiting to have, maybe they feel guilt or worse, maybe they are the victim and they could never work it out with the person who hurt them. When someone is dying with unresolved stuff, that is just the worst agony. And when the living hold on to that bitterness without anyone to help them, it can be heartbreaking. Of course, it does not have to be that way. Mary's husband, Joseph, would have been about 30 or 35 years when Jesus was born. That was the norm there. People lived to about 45, average age, which means that Jesus would have watched his father die somewhere around 10 or 15 years old, maybe 20. Might have been old age. Joseph worked hard. It might have been something to do with Roman oppression. That's how Jesus went. We don't know how, his, uh, how Joseph died, but when Joseph died, you can imagine all the Jewish men in Nazareth would go and sit shiva, and maybe the women would cook and they would cry and they would tell stories. But do you think that there were unresolved issues between Jesus and Joseph? Was there pain? Yeah, there always is. Fathers and children are always going to have pain. But were there hurts? Every relationship. Were there scars that they acknowledged and they probably got over them? Yeah, that, that kind of thing happened. Were there things that they wish at the end they could have said to each other? Maybe so. But do you think that the two of them ever skipped an opportunity to work through their struggles? I just, I, I can't believe that. Because everything we know about Joseph, he was an honorable, hard-working man, absolutely devoted to his wife and family. Uh, he protected them from aggression. He protected them from tension when they went to Egypt. He was a man who taught his oldest son's life lessons and, and how to work with, with his hands, how to be a man of body and soul, to move toward the heart of gold, of God. And it's just a guess, but I think whatever stuff that they had in the normal process of growing up, they probably worked it out before it was too late. Dad, you were really hard on me in the workshop when I was a kid. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm proud of what you've become, son. Uh, son, I know how much that you love God, but it was awkward for me when you started using words like father about someone else. Um, Dad, I'm sorry if that hurt you. That's okay. I've gotten through it. And I understand now. You were able to teach me something. Son, I know I didn't say it enough, but I love you, Dad. I always knew that, and I'll stay right by, your sa- right by your side so you're never alone, even as you go to your Father above. Whatever stuff they had between each other, there was always room, and they took that room to step toward reconciliation. You're my son. I love you. I'm proud of you. Whatever struggles they had, there was always room to lean toward God's hope for all of us. You've been a great dad. I love you, I forgive you, I'm proud of what you've done. May we all reach toward relationships in which we can hear and say those kind of things. Especially when we prepare to say goodbye. May we find the strength in God's tender words. You're such an important part of my life. I love you and I hope you can forgive me for all the messiness that has passed between us. I'm so proud of what you've done with your life. I won't forget you. May we take off the burdens between us and lay them at God's feet gently. Amen.